Hello and welcome to Toronto. Uh, welcome to World Parkinson's program, Facebook live session. We apologize uh, because of some technical issues. We are still learning how to do this. Uh, we get a little bit delayed. Uh, hopefully, uh, as time goes by, we will uh, become more expert in this and we'll be able to start on time. Uh, we have uh, our IT team helping me how to do this. So, we will be taking questions uh, live uh, from uh, people uh, who would like to learn more about Parkinson's. Uh, this is uh, for educational purposes uh, only and uh, treatment of patients uh, depend upon their own uh, physician or a neurologist. <coughs> we had started this um, uh, sessions uh, because uh, sometime uh, patients, when they go to see their physicians, uh, they don't have time to uh, uh, answer their questions fully. Uh, they are busy. At other times, uh, the patients may forget questions or care partners. Uh, so this is a time when they can ask their questions, and we will try our best uh, to answer them uh, as uh, uh, they ask us. We were talking about... Uh, uh, issues uh, with uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, problems last time. We have a question here. Uh, what is the progression rate of the disease in middle age women who is on treatment? Uh, Parkinson's uh, prognosis or progression of uh, condition is individual. Uh, and depends uh, upon each patient. Uh, overall, uh, uh, we divide Parkinson's into uh, uh, two main uh, uh, two main classes or types uh, for the sake of simplicity. Uh, one is uh, tremor dominant Parkinson's, and uh, the other one is non uh, tremor dominant Parkinson's. Uh, so. <clears throat> Patients who have a very obvious tremor, of course, uh, uh, that type of Parkinson's they have, we call it tremor-dominant Parkinson's. Overall, that has a good uh, prognosis uh, as compared to those who don't have a tremor. So when we use, uh, when we use word prognosis, it means uh, uh, all of uh, things uh, like symptoms, the course of the disease, the complications, uh, uh, of disease and the complications of treatment. Uh, so the disease progresses slowly. Overall, uh, most patients uh, uh, should be good for uh, first uh, several years, which we call honeymoon period, first uh, uh, five to seven years. Uh, and uh, the disease progresses afterwards uh, a little bit faster. And uh, uh, the average uh, survival rate uh, somewhere uh, around 15 years or so, uh, but there are many patients uh, who have Parkinson's for 20 years, 25 years, sometimes 35 years, and uh, uh, they still uh, are on treatment uh, and uh, they are doing reasonably. However, in patients uh, who are younger uh, and don't have uh, other comorbidities, uh, so uh, they do much better. Uh, so, uh, so patients uh, in their uh, 50s, they should be able to uh, even work for a few years after diagnosis, uh, and uh, the condition in them progresses uh, uh, slowly. Uh, so we were talking about uh, we were talking about dementia last time. Uh, someone asked. Uh, someone has asked question about uh, uh, a, uh, about uh, anger and uh, frustration. Patients getting upset. Uh, so uh, Parkinson's patients have uh, uh, have uh, uh, psychosis uh, as uh, the condition uh, progresses. Uh, those patients who have psychosis, they they have. Uh, they have visual hallucinations. Sometimes they may have delusions uh, or illusions, and uh, 
uh, these patients uh, have much higher incidence of uh, having uh, 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 trouble with dementia, memory, or cognitive issues. And uh, <clears throat> once these patients have these problems, uh, the, uh, the anger uh, or behavioral issues, uh, being agitated uh, or getting upset, uh, is not uncommon, uh, especially as the disease progresses, these patients may require um, instructions or supervision uh, for their daily activities such as uh, uh, dressing or feeding or using washroom. And sometimes if you instruct these patients more than once, they might get very upset or agitated or frustrated. Uh, these patients may have issues with uh, sleep as well, so if they don't sleep well at night time, of course in the day they, they feel quite uh, uh, tired uh, and sleepy and they are agitated. Uh, so these problems uh, uh, do progress with the time and uh, patients uh, need to be assessed fully and treated uh, with medications. Uh, uh, these things um, can, be, uh, can be improved. <clears throat> the last time we were uh, speaking about uh, uh, weight loss in patients with Parkinson's, uh, I was uh, at a seminar and someone had asked a question uh, about weight loss in Parkinson's disease. Uh, uh, maintaining proper height and weight is very important uh, in patients with Parkinson's. However, as Parkinson's disease uh, uh, as Parkinson's disease advances. Uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, do any exercise or, meet, uh, or meditation are prescribed for these patients? So I always uh, tell my patients about exercise. Uh, exercise, I believe, at every stage of Parkinson's for every patient uh, is very helpful. Uh, in addition to treatment with medicines, uh, so exercise is an adjunctive treatment. Uh, so uh, the treatment uh, or or the or the exercises uh, they are again uh, they are again according to the capacity of the individual person. So we tell patients if uh, if they have advanced Parkinson's disease, uh, they are not. Uh, uh, their, uh, their mobility is limited and uh, they are not able to walk independently so these patients uh, should start at least uh, from stretching exercises, passive the stretching exercises, passive uh, joint uh, uh, range of motion exercises uh, so every joint uh, with, uh, with someone can be moved uh, into their uh, range of motion and if this is done repetitively uh, say 10 to 15 times each joint slowly uh, and uh, uh, starting from shoulder, elbow, wrist, and then hip joint, knee joint, ankle joints. And uh, uh, this would uh, help to maintain their flexibility of muscles. Their range of motion will be maintained. Their muscles would uh, uh, stay relatively in a, a strong position. And if patients are able to walk on their own, uh, their walking uh, is... Uh, uh, one of the best exercise because it uh, helps uh, to keep the strength of your muscles. It maintains uh, your blood pressure and uh, <clears throat> also uh, it's good for bone health. Uh, patients who are uh, very active physically, they should uh, do resistance exercises. So uh, they can start simply, simply by, simply by walking, gardening uh, or their daily chores and then slowly they can build into resistance exercises uh, which may be for uh, biceps muscles or uh, uh, with the weights uh, uh, and also uh, same thing for lower extremities. Uh, so uh, the resistance exercises uh, uh, should be done uh, at least five days a week and uh, they should be or at least three to five days a week and they should be uh, half an hour to 45 minutes uh, duration. Uh, patients should take short breaks uh, in between to relax and then engage in exercise activity. So physiotherapists can make a plan uh, for uh, uh, each patient uh, for the exercise uh, they can do. We are developing uh, 
and exercise diary also and hopefully within a few months uh, we will be able to complete this work in which we have listed uh, most of the exercises for Parkinson's and patients uh, and physiotherapist or patient and their physician can choose and select what they would like to do and then they can enter into the log uh, on a daily basis. We have uh, uh, an other question. Uh, is uh, driving affected uh, by Parkinson's. This is a very complex topic and uh, lengthy topic. Uh, patients in the beginning of Parkinson's disease uh, may, be, um, may feel that they are okay to drive. However, as the disease progresses, uh, their reaction time slows down. Uh, the patients may have trouble changing uh, uh, traffic signals or uh, uh, following the changing of uh, traffic signals or changing of lanes uh, and they may have trouble mapping out where they want to go and follow the directions. So it all depends uh, upon uh, the uh, patient, their care partner and physician as a team uh, to assess every patient uh, uh, if they are a safe driver and uh, we have written uh, on this topic some simple uh, um, um, simple information uh, to start with uh, which can be found on the website of uh, World Parkinson's Program www.pdprogram.org uh, it's a I believe brochure number uh, uh, 8 or 9 uh, which talks about uh, driving in Parkinson's so some information is uh, uh, there and uh, you can uh, start from there We have another question, uh, tips uh, for care partners to deal with early stages uh, of Parkinson's patients. In the beginning of Parkinson's disease, uh, the care partner may need to support the patient just emotionally <clears throat> and morally be with them, but as the disease progresses, the physical support is needed. Uh, the patient's uh, uh, may need uh, help with their daily activities uh, such as uh, dressing uh, or preparing meals and uh, uh, showering. Uh, so the need for physical support increases as the disease progresses. In early stages of Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, having a very, if a care partner is a spouse of a patient, having an open discussion uh, with the patient uh, or the discussion between the patient and the care partner uh, and having a frank, uh, uh, frank, um, detailed discussion is very reassuring. And also, uh, the patients uh, uh, may need help uh, uh, with uh, keeping track of their appointments uh, or watching the effect of medications uh, and uh, how uh, how a medication was effective or it has caused any side effect so these uh, details patient may not be able to note uh, all of these details themselves so a care partner may help uh, to make notes uh, about the use of medication their efficacy their side effect and uh, they should accompany uh, them to their uh, uh, physician appointment and uh, then they can relay that information to them so that uh, any modifications which are made um, are in uh, uh, are, 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 uh, everyone is uh, everyone is uh, uh, online with that uh, patient care partner and the physician so this becomes important as the disease progresses because when disease progresses patients would not be able to uh, to uh, uh, to keep this information uh, together or, or present it to their physician. Uh, so uh, the need uh, for being with patient, uh, taking these notes, uh, following uh, uh, their progress and uh, keeping track of medications uh, is very important uh, with the advanced uh, Parkinson's disease. We were, dis uh, we were discussing sleep problems in Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> we have another question. Uh, can there be a false diagnosis regarding the disease that a person has Parkinson's? 
The diagnosis of Parkinson's disease uh, depends upon uh, symptoms, motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, as we have discussed in our previous uh, sessions. Uh, uh, on a resting tremor, slowness of movement or bradykinesia, and uh, stiffness, of, uh, stiffness of muscles or uh, rigidity. So uh, these, uh, uh, these symptoms uh, are uh, uh, discussed in detail uh, by the physician and the patient, and the physician does uh, the thorough assessment. Uh, there is no uh, test for Parkinson's disease. However, uh, with respect to uh, a misdiagnosis or a wrong diagnosis, uh, because the patients, uh, because the patients uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, sometime, uh, uh, sometime think that these symptoms could be uh, due to other uh, other comorbidities uh, such as arthritis, or sometimes they feel uh, aging, uh, or if patients have. Uh, uh, low thyroid function or patients are depressed uh, so these patients may be slow in doing things so slowness of movement can be mistaken um, if uh, it is due to other things and uh, sometime with age uh, uh, we all slow down uh, so it's important to note in decrement that when patients are doing repetitive movements such as uh, with finger tapping opening and closing of hands hand turning it's important for the physician to note at the rhythm of the movement is the rhythm uh, fine is uh, the amplitude good is the speed of the movement good and uh, do they fatigue when they do that movement and in most patients with Parkinson's disease since it starts on one side so they there is a symmetry of the movements. So these things, and then examining the patient for a resting tremor uh, in a very, uh, very complete repose when they are completely rested, they are lying down in bed, their, their hands and legs are quite relaxed, and then sometimes you can use mental tasking to stress patients and this can bring out their tremor more. When the patients are walking, you can see their tremor. If it is subtle, it may become more prominent. So based on the motor symptoms, uh, same thing uh, for stiffness or rigidity, the examination has to be very careful. However, if the exam is not done carefully, then one can miss the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Or sometime if the person who is assessing the patient does not have enough training uh, or expertise, uh, they can of course uh, uh, not only misdiagnosis, they can sometimes wrongly diagnose patients. We have come across uh, patients in our uh, uh, in our clinical uh, settings uh, where we had to stop medications uh, because patients did not uh, have Parkinson's disease, and then uh, the the uh, the diagnosis. Uh, of Parkinson's disease was taken off of them. Sometimes conditions like essential tremor, it's a different type of tremor which affects uh, mostly upper extremities, hands, uh, and it occurs on when, uh, when people are holding things. Uh, so uh, these, um, uh, these, um, uh, these type of tremor uh, sometimes can have a resting component if the muscles are not relaxed or if the action tremor is quite advanced then the, uh, then the resting tremor uh, can be there and so someone can mistakenly uh, based on that component of resting tremor and some slowness of movement due to aging because these patients are usually adul uh, these patients are usually elderly so they could uh, uh, think that they have Parkinson's disease therefore sometime uh, seeing these patients over time, not rushing to make a diagnosis in the first uh, appointment uh, might be helpful if the physician is not sure. The other thing is uh, referring patients to those physicians uh, who subspecialize uh, in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease. That is um, uh, helpful as well and it can decrease the chances of uh, misdiagnosis or wrong diagnosis. There are many other conditions which uh, uh, can be uh, mistaken for Parkinson's disease and uh, physicians have to be very careful. We have a question. Uh, uh, is restless legs syndrome associated with Parkinson's? Uh, I'm sure most of you might have heard about restless legs syndrome. Uh, restless legs syndrome 
is a condition where patients uh, have an urge or a desire to move their legs or stretch their legs, especially when they're sitting down and when they start walking, these symptoms either go away completely or they at least partially improve. These symptoms usually occur in the evening. They may start in the late afternoon and they build up slowly and they affect the patients as long as they are sitting. If they're watching TV, they're taking a ride in a car or in a plane, or if they are reading, so they have this creeping, uh, a sensation, a kind of numbness, some people describe it as an, uh, as an itchiness or a, uh, a, or a sensation of crawling in their legs, uh, which usually starts from the calves and uh, they, they, they have to uh, move their legs uh, to, to get uh, relief of these symptoms. And when these patients lie down on bed, then these symptoms are, uh, uh, are very bothersome and they are not uh, uh, able to fall asleep for several hours. So restless leg syndrome as a condition can occur on its own by itself and in, in most of the reports uh, the the, um, the prevalence of RLS is reported uh, somewhere between 5 to 7 percent uh, but in case of Parkinson's disease uh, some experts have reported uh, the prevalence up to 20-25 percent. Usually the restless leg syndrome uh, which is uh, accompanied uh, with Parkinson's disease that is less intense as uh, compared to restless leg syndrome which occurs on its own. The restless leg syndrome uh, may be a challenge to treat uh, because patients uh, uh, with Parkinson's disease they have uh, other issues with cognition or hallucinations and the medication which are used for restless leg syndrome or some of the medications uh, they could uh, cause uh, uh, issues with hallucinations. Therefore, the physicians have to be uh, very, uh, very careful uh, upon selecting the therapy for uh, restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome can be sometimes quite disabling because patients uh, they have to either keep on moving, uh, of course, because of Parkinson's disease, their mobility is already affected, so they are not able to uh, move around to relieve these uh, symptoms. Uh, at other times, uh, they have trouble falling asleep, mm, and uh, if they are awake uh, at night time, then in the morning, uh, they feel quite uh, sleepy. So, <clears throat> medications which are used for restless leg syndrome uh, are usually dopamine agonists. Uh, dopamine agonists such as premipexol and rupinirol uh, are uh, first-line medications. Uh, they are started usually uh, just before the time of onset of the symptoms. Usually the first dose is taken in the afternoon and then it, they can be given twice a day uh, before bedtime and, uh, and, and the dose can be adjusted accordingly according to the symptoms of uh, the patients. We have a question, uh, is Parkinson's disease uh, hereditary? Uh, so Parkinson's disease uh, uh, is about 10 to 15 percent cases. It's hereditary. Uh, most of the cases of Parkinson's disease, they are sporadic. Uh, so par the cases of Parkinson's disease which are hereditary, their onset uh, is different than uh, patients in home. It is, uh, uh, it, it is non-hereditary or sporadic. Patients with hereditary Parkinson's disease usually have onset of disease much earlier in age. If patients uh, start developing symptoms of Parkinson's disease uh, before the age of 40 or around the age of 40, so then uh, likely uh, they have genetic Parkinson's disease. However, this is not essential in every case. Uh, so family history is important. And so physicians should ask about family members, relatives, affected with Parkinson's disease and sometimes you can find in young onset Parkinson's disease that they would have relatives who are affected with Parkinson's disease and if a patient has first degree relative affected with Parkinson's disease their risk of having Parkinson's disease is higher than those people who don't have any first degree relative affected with Parkinson's disease. There has been uh, important uh, uh, important uh, uh, move uh, in this case in last uh, couple of decades. Uh, so <clears throat> in mid-90s uh, we started learning more about genetic cases of Parkinson's disease and since then there has been many mutations uh, which have uh, 
uh, come across uh, uh, which which uh, which have uh, which we have learned in the cause of Parkinson's disease. We have a question: If hereditary is it maternal? Uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, when it is hereditary, uh, it follows a very complex phenomenon. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, it it does not necessarily follow uh, the the well known Mendelian pattern of inheritance in all patients. Uh, so it could be sometimes autosomal dominant. In other cases, it could be autosomal recessive. Uh, the it's uh, it, it's very uh, difficult to uh, to explain this um, uh, how it. Uh, uh, how uh, it follows uh, the inheritance pattern. Uh, there could be some uh, X-linked or uh, there could be some uh, forms of uh, Parkinsonism, not purely Parkinson disease, uh, some forms of Parkinsonism which are with dystonia that they could be linked to uh, inheritance through X chromosome. However, in most cases, uh, it's a uh, complex uh, presentation of uh, genetic Parkinson's disease which uh, does not necessarily follow the Mendelian pattern and it becomes very difficult to say that if a patient's mother had Parkinson's disease they would develop Parkinson's disease or if a patient had Parkinson's disease that they inherited this from their mother or from their father. Another question, um, how can I deal with freezing spells? What can I do keep moving? Freezing is a phenomenon which is very typical uh, for Parkinsonism. However, it's uh, more common in patients with atypical Parkinsonism than idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Uh, freezing is a sudden arrest of mobility. Patients may be doing any movement and their movement is arrested. Suppose if they are walking, they feel their feet get uh, stuck to the ground, feet get glued to the ground, they have trouble lifting their feet and this occurs more in time-restricted activities, such as stepping into an elevator. <clears throat> so these patients, are, uh, they, uh, their upper body uh, seems to keep on moving, however, their legs get uh, stuck uh, to the ground and they have trouble stepping into the elevator uh, or into a revolving door. Uh, so uh, this leads to falls sometimes because their uh, upper body is moving, their legs are arrested. Uh, so freezing, uh, is uh, not uncommon in advanced Parkinson's disease. So these patients, uh, uh, they uh, suffer falls, uh, which can lead to fractures and so many problems. Uh, freezing of heat uh, should be assessed thoroughly, and uh, patients, uh, uh, if they follow some, uh, some mental cues, uh, they could overcome uh, uh, freezing of heat. Um, I suppose if uh, patients uh, you know, are walking, they get uh, a sudden arrest of mobility due to freezing and they they follow uh, some uh, line or a, some pattern on their carpet or uh, on, uh, uh, on a zebra crossing and they try to overstep this line. This would help them to uh, break their uh, uh, cycle of freezing and they can uh, start walking again. So, uh, for this, there have been many devices which has uh, been used uh, by patients, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, there are canes and walkers which uh, have a, a laser beam. The laser beam uh, points out straight and patient can see it. And then when patient have freezing, uh, they try to overstep this laser beam which uh, helps uh, uh, to break their cycle of freezing. What we do in our clinic, we have a cable ties. So we tell patients they can put a cable tie at the lower end of their cane, and one end of the cable tie can be pointing. And uh, when they get freezing, so they try to overstep this cable tie, which acts as a mental cue, and this helps them to break the cycle of freezing, and they can start walking again. Other things, uh, they can march uh, along a song, or they can think, uh, they can count, like, uh, some patients we tell they can count one, two, three, and uh, at three they can try to lift their foot and they can break the cycle of freezing. Uh, freezing uh, is uh, quite commonly seen in patients uh, uh, who have uh, <coughs> uh, 
who have atypical Parkinsonism, such as uh, vascular Parkinsonism, progressive supranuclear palsy. However, in idiopathic Parkinson disease, freezing is not uncommon, especially as the disease progresses. And freezing not only uh, affect uh, walking, it can affect other activities as well. When patients are using their hands, they can still have freezing and sometimes patients could have start hesitation when they're speaking and with the other activities. We have another question. Uh, how effective is levodopa? So uh, levodopa is uh, a, a kind of gold standard medication for Parkinson disease. Uh, it came in uh, uh, 1960s. Uh, so the uh, levodopa changes into body uh, into dopamine when it goes into brain so because of dopamine deficiency in patients with Parkinson's disease when levodopa changes into dopamine uh, it helps uh, again uh, with their movements. Uh, levodopa is uh, one of the most effective medication for Parkinson's disease and uh, most commonly used uh, however in patients uh, who have a very young onset of Parkinson's disease, these patients can develop motor fluctuations very quickly. So, uh, therefore, not every patient is started on levodopa from the beginning. However, most patients uh, would need uh, uh, most patients uh, would need levodopa in the course of disease, uh, sometime uh, in, in the course of the disease, and uh, in. Uh, in young onset patients, uh, there may be other medications, and these patients are usually started, and slowly uh, they might become more slow or more bradykinetic, and the need of levodopa uh, may be increased as the disease progresses. Most patients in first uh, uh, three to five years, they may be uh, good with um, 300 to 600 uh, milligram of levodopa uh, daily, uh, levodopa is started gradually. Usually, uh, we start levodopa uh, with half a tablet a day, and uh, individual physicians uh, uh, have uh, their own uh, way of starting this. As a student of Parkinson's disease, what I learned uh, from my practice that I start half a tablet for the first week. In this case, patients don't feel nauseous or vomiting, and they are adjusted to half a dose. Then we add half a tablet at noon time, and then we add and another week half a tablet at night time and then we increase the morning dose to one. This is how we titrate and we had found that uh, most patients are able to tolerate this. Otherwise, if levodopa is titrated quickly, then these patients uh, may develop uh, issues, uh, uh, with, uh, issues with nausea, vomiting uh, and uh, uh, so many other symptoms. We have another question. Uh, can diet have some effect on Parkinson's? With respect to diet and Parkinson's, uh, a lot has been published. So a well-balanced diet is uh, what is uh, required for patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, so uh, diet does not have any special role in modifying the course of disease, but because of various symptoms of uh, uh, various symptoms of Parkinson's, uh, diet is important. For example, patients with Parkinson's disease, they have constipation. So in patients with constipation, they should add more fiber and fluid in their diet. Sometimes uh, liquids such as uh, warm liquids in the morning, they might help. Prune juice is another thing. Uh, patients find it very helpful if they drink it every night about four ounces of prune juice. Uh, so those patients who have uh, incontinence of urination, they have uh, um, learned from their experience that cranberry juice uh, can also decrease the odor uh, of uh, their urine. And uh, sometimes if uh, patients are taking a heavy protein meal and they are combining uh, uh, and they are taking levodopa at the same time, then uh, the then the amino acids uh, in the protein might compete with levodopa for absorption in the body. So uh, the levodopa absorption may be delayed. Therefore, most experts suggest that if they are uh, planning a heavy protein meal, they could, uh, they could reserve that uh, at the end of the day, uh, or if in the day, then they should they have a gap of an hour or so uh, with levodopa and the protein-rich meal. 
uh, so that the uh, absorption of levodopa is not affected. Otherwise, uh, some, in some cases, as the disease progresses, so patients with Parkinson's disease start losing weight. So in patients uh, who are losing weight, we uh, ask them to eat very well, not to skip any meals, and also eat nutritious meals because weight loss becomes a problem as the disease progresses. However, um, uh, overeating or, uh, um, or gaining weight uh, is not good for patients. If patients have uh, uh, diabetes, uh, then patients should be very careful um, with uh, uh, the diet, what they eat uh, in case of Parkinson's disease and diabetes both. And there has been some findings of a uh, link of diabetes and Parkinson's. And uh, in some of uh, scenarios, we run into difficulty when patients are uh, uh, are on dopamine agonists or they develop uh, what we call compulsive eating. Some patients, uh, we have seen some cases um, who are on uh, dopaminergic medications, especially dopamine agonists, and they develop uh, behavioral issues such as compulsive uh, gambling, compulsive eating, or shopping when they have compulsive eating. So some patients start eating much more and they have diabetes. Then not only this puts their uh, blood sugars out of rack, but it also causes problems. We have another question. Uh, can a PD patient also suffer from liver disease and cervical? Will the liver condition affect the medication dose? Uh, well, there is no direct link uh, of uh, uh, liver disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, the um, liver disease uh, could be an independent thing than than uh, than Parkinson's disease. Uh, so, uh, most of the patients uh, uh, who are taking medications uh, for Parkinson's disease, they don't find any problems uh, if the patient is. Uh, we have another. A question with it if the patient is also suffering from liver disease. So most patients uh, don't find any problems with uh, the Parkinson's disease medications. We have seen patients who have uh, uh, hepatitis uh, and uh, uh, they uh, don't have any trouble uh, taking levodopa. Uh, so uh, with respect to the direct link, there is uh, no obvious link in liver disease and levodopa. Uh, but with respect to medications, some of the medications, uh, such as amantadine, uh, can affect, uh, can be affected if the kidney function is no good, but not the liver function uh, affecting uh, the uh, medications of uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. So um, uh, we were talking about. Uh, uh, we were talking about uh, weight diet and Parkinson's disease. Someone was asking, a side question came in between about the liver disease. So with respect to the diet, uh, so patients uh, uh, who have advanced Parkinson's disease and then the weight loss becomes a problem. So we ask these patients to add Ensure uh, so as a dietary supplement. Uh, so Ensure is uh, uh, quite helpful to maintain their weight. Uh, because if patients don't maintain uh, adequate weight, uh, their health um, starts uh, deteriorating slowly. Uh, so, and uh, this leads to more and more complications. Also, with respect to diet, most patients with Parkinson's disease, in some reports, have been found to have low vitamin D. There is no direct link in vitamin D in Parkinson's disease, but. Uh, uh, due to various causes, uh, not only Parkinson's disease, other neurological diseases such as multiple sclerosis patients have been found to have low vitamin D. So for GPs, it's important to uh, check the vitamin D levels in the beginning of disease and keep them at a good uh, state, especially in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and because patients have issues with bone health, patients are not moving around, so their bone health is affected. So uh, the bones become uh, weak slowly because of resorption, so having a good vitamin D uh, levels is uh, very important uh, uh, in these patients. So uh, we covered uh, most of the things about diet uh, and Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> uh, 
we have a question about uh, uh, sleep problems and Parkinson disease. Uh, sleep problems uh, are not uncommon in patients with Parkinson disease. These sleep problems could be of many different types. Uh, most patients uh, have trouble falling asleep at the onset of the night. Uh, when they go to bed, they stay awake for some time uh, and uh, they are not able to fall asleep. So they try to get out of bed and walk around and then they go to bed again or sometimes patients start making trips to the washrooms. Uh, so mm, there are many factors which can uh, cause uh, this problem. Uh, such as if patients have issues with anxiety or depression or if they have hallucinations and demented patients sometimes they can get uh, sundowning or agitation in the evening times so they have trouble falling asleep uh, at night and other patients uh, uh, so other than these uh, pain or cramping numbness and tingling difficulty turning over in bed so all these uh, issues can uh, cause uh, trouble with uh, uh, falling asleep at night time and other patients have difficulty uh, of multiple awakenings so they would wake up uh, uh, at night time uh, several times and then they can't fall back to sleep so this leads to sleep fragmentation and some patients have a need to urinate uh, again and again during the night because of the you know, hyperactive bladder uh, so they have uh, trouble uh, 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 keeping their uh, sleep uh, smooth and straight throughout the night and other patients uh, may have early morning awakenings if they have depression uh, and sometime in Parkinson disease and uh, if their nighttime sleep in this way uh, is not fulfilled so these patients uh, may have excessive daytime sleepiness uh, so they start dozing off in the daytime <clears throat> because of these uh, uh, because their nighttime uh, sleep is not uh, fulfilled and there is another condition uh, it, it's called REM behavioral disorder or RBD the REM behavioral disorder is a phenomenon of sleep where patients are uh, noted to be shouting yelling uh, choking other people or uh, moving and flailing their limbs uh, thrashing their body uh, in sleep at night time and most patients don't have any recall in the morning so these uh, sleep problems are quite common in patients with Parkinson disease and they can complicate the course of the disease and uh, cause further complications in the management of Parkinson disease. And so we advise patients to follow the principles of sleep hygiene. Some patients try to go to bed very early, like 6 or 7 o'clock they go to bed. Of course, if you go to bed that early, you will not be able to stay asleep uh, beyond 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and then you will be awake uh, in the night time so we tell these patients to sleep a little bit late uh, such as around 10 o'clock or so so they can have uh, a good night's sleep for four or five hours at least and then if they have to go to washroom they can wake up and uh, they, they can go back to sleep again and so otherwise we ask patients to uh, sleep in a very quiet environment uh, in a very comfortable uh, place with a good temperature and um, uh, patients uh, should uh, try to do something relaxing before they go to sleep uh, and they should not worry about things which are beyond their control uh, so uh, patients should try avoid uh, taking any fluids uh, in the evenings uh, because if they take fluids their need to go to washroom would increase and they have to wake up multiple times and other uh, thing which could help is uh, keeping the sleeping time fixed uh, every day even on the weekends they should sleep the same uh, amount their time to go to bed should be fixed and if they have trouble falling asleep then it's better to come out of bed and um, go to the other room or go to the living room and try to do something rather than uh, start reading in the bed or doing activities while they are still in bed they interfere their sleep uh, further <coughs> Other than this, if patients have ex uh, patients exercise in the daytime, uh, their nighttime sleep would improve. Uh, as, uh, however, patients should avoid uh, late, uh, late evening exercises. If they do exercise in the nighttime, then uh, they still be very active and this, this would uh, uh, prevent them falling uh, uh, asleep at night time. Uh, the, other, uh, um, the other comorbidities which occur with Parkinson's disease uh, such as pain, the treatment of pain, the treatment of dystonia, sometimes patients wake up with curling of toes uh, or their legs at night time, numbness and tingling, 
can affect uh, <coughs> numbness and tingling can affect their sleep as well so if these issues are treated uh, then uh, uh, we should uh, uh, if these issues are treated then uh, uh, we should see that sleep of the patient is improved we have another question uh, <coughs> what should PD patients avoid uh, I think PD patients uh, should try to uh, live a as normal life as possible I tell Parkinson's patients all the time that just don't get preoccupied with uh, that oh I got this disease and now I'm disabled I can't do many things and what will happen to me in future I think PD patients should try to live as good life as productive life as they can especially in the beginning of the condition um, the Parkinson's uh, uh, should not overpower you. Uh, the uh, few things which uh, patients should avoid is falls. Falls is a, a very uh, a very problematic thing in Parkinson's disease. Uh, since patients have issues with their balance, uh, their uh, physical body is altered. One side of the body is affected with Parkinson's disease more, so physical structure of the body is affected, their speed of walking is decreased, their reaction time is increased, so freezing of the gait. So all these things uh, add up uh, to uh, trouble keeping with their balance. And so avoiding falls, uh, which usually does not start in the beginning of patients with Parkinson's disease unless they have atypical Parkinsonism. And so falls should be avoided. Uh, ex um, excessive stress, uh, which uh, makes uh, patients incapacitated, should be should be avoided. Uh, and also, PD patients uh, should avoid making changes in in their medications. We have had patients uh, they would start making changes in their medication. They feel a little bit slow or they feel a little bit stiff. They will take an extra dose of levodopa right away without waiting. So I tell patients that uh, Parkinson's disease is a fluctuating condition. Parkinson's disease uh, uh, does not stay the same all the time. Even during the course of a uh, day, uh, patients, uh, uh, patient symptoms uh, uh, change. So we should, be, uh, we should be patient with these things. Most things improve uh, on their own. And sometimes for a few days, patients might uh, run into a problem with some complications uh, before uh, making changes uh, into medications on their own. Uh, they should try to uh, they should try to wait and see if uh, these things go away on their own. Therefore, learning about the condition, uh, getting education, is the first step in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. I always say, tell my patients, uh, those who fight Parkinson's with knowledge, always find solutions. So. If you learn more about the disease, you know what is what could come in future. So you are not only mentally ready, but you make all the preparations uh, to to um, overcome those issues uh, which uh, might uh, uh, cause a problem in future. Uh, we did have a question from last uh, uh, last session. Uh, uh, we were not able to answer. Uh, I will ask our IT team if they can pull up that uh, question and probably we can uh, answer that. <clears throat> so patients uh, should also avoid uh, uh, being awake at night time uh, till late or do things uh, which are beyond their capacity. Uh, they should try to keep their one hand free all the time and uh, if possible, uh, if someone can, uh, uh, as the disease progresses, if someone can stay with them uh, that's better because uh, if patients are alone and they fall or they have some complication of the disease and then no one is checking upon them uh, so these patients might have difficulty uh, with those issues uh, so also exercise as I mentioned uh, before is important however patients should avoid uh, going beyond their limits uh, like swimming in, in, in deep water or weight lifting with heavy weights, uh, which are quite uh, heavy and beyond uh, uh, beyond the uh, beyond their capacity, uh, should not be done. Uh, exercises should be gentle, and they should be tailored according to uh, the capacity of the patient. Uh, therefore, 
the uh, consultation with a physiotherapist is quite important because physiotherapists not only can advise you mm, about the exercises but they can also tell you what exercises are good for patients and what exercises they should avoid so we had a last uh, last uh, week question uh, uh, my mom feels she has absolutely no control over her anxiety anger rage and emotional um, emotional regularity the question is only half obvious uh, I hope we can get to this uh, uh, question so um, anxiety is uh, not uncommon in patients with uh, Parkinson disease uh, patients uh, start worrying about things which uh, uh, are uh, uh, which they should not worry about or which are beyond their control so some patients get uh, panicky they could get uh, palpitations I'll read the question again now we have a full question last week question my mom feels she has absolutely no control over anxiety anger rage emotional regulations and this has caused relationship stress is this common in PD patients though I understand anxiety and depression are common or is this more personality individual coping mental health is seeing her and she will be getting counseling anxiety is not uncommon in Parkinson disease many patients uh, with Parkinson disease uh, as I was saying not only they start uh, they they worry about things uh, which they should not but they also worry about very minor things and sometimes uh, there is uh, no concern and they they start getting anxious on their own and some patients have a paranoia they would start uh, uh, feeling that their spouse is cheating on them or someone is stealing uh, their money or someone is poisoning their food so these things uh, do cause relationship issues anxiety itself could cause issues with the relationship uh, so so um, So these, uh, so these uh, problems, uh, uh, there was some interruption about a question from uh, somewhere. So, uh, so anxiety and anger and paranoia is not uncommon in patients with Parkinson's disease. Of course, if patients have a, um, an issue like this uh, a, or a psychiatric condition from before having Parkinson's disease, this would make it more complicated. But in patients who don't have any history of psychiatric issues and they have Parkinson's disease, that can of course cause uh, uh, problems uh, in their daily life and it's very difficult to cope these issues. So care partners have to be very patient uh, with the patient. They could try to explain them gently, spending more time with them, taking them out and explaining them that these things uh, are not real. Uh, and they and they should not and, and they should not enforce uh, their beliefs it, it it might helpful it might be helpful also although at this stage when patients have this much anxiety which is affecting their daily life they do need treatment so with medications uh, we we can uh, uh, significantly improve these issues uh, so these patients should be assessed by their neurologist who specializes in Parkinson's disease or psychiatrists, sometimes medications uh, uh, such as uh, long-acting benzodiazepine, uh, long -acting benzodiazepines uh, could help, uh, low doses. In other cases, antipsychotics uh, like utiapine may be used at a very low dose uh, uh, and they could be uh, very helpful in these patients. I think we uh, are getting a signal from the team that the time is over uh, so we will see you uh, next uh, week uh, so again a reminder uh, that uh, uh, we will be meeting again at 11 o'clock uh, next uh, Sunday uh, so uh, sometime it gets us a little bit delay when we start uh, our sessions because uh, of the technical issues uh, I have uh, the co-founder of World Parkinson's program helping us uh, to do these uh, sessions uh, uh, successfully uh, so 
uh, with our IT issues, it uh, gets us delayed sometime. So we apologize for this. Hopefully we'll be able to start on time next week. Please spread this word among your friends or colleagues who do you know, and uh, they might also be uh, finding this helpful to join our conversation. And so again, a reminder that this conversation is only for educational purposes. Uh, there is no advice for pharmacological treatment given. Uh, a, 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 and every patient to, should discuss uh, with their own neurologist about the adjustment of their treatment. Uh, and uh, hopefully provide us feedback also uh, in your uh, uh, in uh, your uh, uh, in your questions. Uh, that uh, how do you find? Do you find it useful or any modifications we need to make? Uh, so sometime uh, I get distracted because uh, uh, the IT team is giving me signal at the same time I have two three questions coming uh, So my apologies. I hope this helps and uh, hope to see you next uh, Sunday at uh, 11 o'clock uh, Thank you, and please do spread the word and uh, for any questions uh, you might check the website of World Parkinson's Program, www.pdprogram.org. Thank you very much.